hao. Welcome everyone to our very first Osmo Tips Q&A session. In this series, we hope to answer as many questions as possible regarding the Osmo. Whatever the question, we'll make sure you get an answer one way or another. So today we've compiled eight questions that came from our lovely subscribers. Yeah, you guys are totally awesome. Thank you. And you guys who aren't subscribed, what are you waiting for? So, let's get to the first question. If I run with the Z axis, stabilization is okay. But if I walk, vertical movement is similar to when I don't use the Z axis. What other walking methods can I try? From Daniel. Well, Daniel, that's a very good question. So if I understand your question correctly, Daniel, your, your concern is you're getting too much of this bobbing movement from the arm itself, regardless of whether you're trying to counterbalance doing this way or doing it that way. From what I've observed, and I'm still doing quite a lot of tests with this thing, is it, it really isn't so much of an issue how much movement you're getting up in here. Because sometimes you get this really exaggerated movement, but then when you look back at the footage, you see that it's pretty stabilized. So I wouldn't worry too much about what you're seeing as the actual movement itself of, of the head, but rather concentrate on how much stabilization you're getting in the footage itself. I know Ken has got a video that is released on his channel, which really shows how as he's moving, you can see this is bobbing up quite a lot, but then when you look at his footage, it looks pretty stable. So let me advise you to just go over to Ken's channel and check out his video that it did, which, you know, which will explain exactly what I'm trying to explain here. But if that fails, there's a couple of other things you could try as well. You could try using different angles of the Z-axis. So what you'd need to do is to obviously press this pivot release button, press that once, and it's kind of like got four positions, I noticed. So if you just twist it until you get the first click, that's the first position. So this is now starting to approach something like a flashlight method that we can use. So you could try walking in this way. Notice it's quite close to the horizontal. You could also try to go a little bit further, further up to the next position here. And now this looks pretty close to horizontal, almost like a flashlight method. So you try that angle and see what that does to your footage. And then the last angle, obviously, is really, this is a low down angle. But again, it just depends how much control this, th this gives you as you're walking. The most important thing is to feel natural and to feel confident and secure. The key thing for me is don't worry so much about how much amplitude you're getting with this bobbing movement because somehow in this whole setup, the, the camera does a decent job of stabilizing it regardless of what kind of movement you're getting here. So I hope that helps answer this question. The next question is, have you been able to try using the Z axis with the extension stick yet? This is from Alex. Alex, that is a remarkable question. So the first thing you want to do is you want to prevent the arm from moving about as it is now. And we can use that little Velcro trick that we become so familiar with. Really, really useful. There, three seconds and it's secure. Next, you want to remove any phone holder or any such attachment that you might have had on these two ends. The first thing I do with this is I unlock this swivel arm to give this ball joint here freedom of movement so that you can screw this on just like that and then you also want to make sure this inner ring is as back as it will go whenever i've tried this method i've preferred to use this rosette mount which is closest to the microphone jack so the first thing i want to do with this swivel lock unlocked is you grab hold of the outer ring and then you basically just screw that on you tend to see there's a small little gap that's remaining there and then you go to the inner ring and start tightening until it's as tight as it will go at this stage the extension rod is still pretty loose and then what you then need to do is to get it into more or less the orientation that you want almost parallel with the arm and then that's when you want to tighten this swivel lock so pretty about finger tight should be fine about there the next thing i do is i 
twist the extension rod to unlock it and then it releases the first the first part and then you just keep twisting ever so slightly this is a very delicate accessory so you don't want to overdo it and then when you've got it like this then you want to twist it to lock it in place the most important thing with this setup is the grip that you make with with the extension rod so what i tend to do is i put my hand in like that and then make sure the bottom of my hand is well supported first of all just like that when i've done that then i kind of turn my hand around like that and then this way i'm able to grip with one hand and all the weight of the stick and the osmo is kind of bearing on my hand like this because you've got the rosette mount at the bottom of the extension rod you can always mount your phone holder in this in this position here you can now remove the velcro to release the z-axis and with this setup you can now shoot you can see it's not as stable and because I've now attached uh, an additional microphone receiver there it's really not as stable as I would like so anyway okay so the first first I want to try is just a little bit of a normal walk just like this I'm really not a fan of this setup here because it does it just doesn't seem stable so anyway let's let's give this a go What's really, really important is this grip that you make. This has got to be as strong as, as, as you possibly can make it. And then with that setup, you know, try and hold it almost maybe to a little bit of a 45 degree angle. And this should, this, this should help quite a bit. And that a little bit like that. And that's the test. I do have to state though that using the z-axis with this extension rod is not one of my favorite ways to use the z-axis. It just feels a little bit fragile. So this is not something, although you can do it the way I've shown you, this is not something that I'm, not, I'm gonna be doing uh, a lot of the times just because you know, it just feels a little bit too flimsy for my liking. The third question is, how can I use the free LUT with the Final Cut Pro? This question is from Tytho and also Zach. Once again, another great question. So, so first of all, this is the place where you'd come to get the free light. If you don't already have it, all you need to do is just fill in your email address, first name, click download, and you got the light straight away. So the question is, can it work? Can you use this light with Final Cut Pro? The answer is absolutely yes. So what you will need though, is you will need to use what is called a LUT utility, and you can get it from this website right here. We're not affiliated with any of these websites, by the way. We're just sharing the information that we have at our disposal. Um, so you can start a free trial. Um, I've tried the free trial. It works. I was able to load the Royal Punch LUT, although the free trial will have like a watermark on it. And if you want to remove that watermark, obviously there is a product that they sell, which will allow you to load the, um, the LUT, not just the Royal Punch LUT, but any LUT for that matter. Um, what I can tell you though is all the LUTs that we created, Osmo Tips, they are all compatible with DaVinci Resolve, Speedgrade, or Final Cut Pro, we've just touched on that, After Effects, Adobe Premiere Pro, Media Encoder, and Photoshop. And if, you, if you're not using any of these, you know, you can always get a free trial. There's nothing to stop you for 30 days. You can do a lot in 30 days. So start a trial, see if you like it. I think, you know, for me... Adobe Premiere Pro is really a great platform for editing because it's constantly evolving and 
um, it, yeah, it's relatively easy to, to work with as well. But that's just me. If you want to use the LUT in Sony Vegas, this LUT plugin will allow you to use the LUTs in Sony Vegas if you happen to use that. Um, I know this is really confirmed by one of the subscribers that they've downloaded the free LUT and it works well with Color Director 4. So this is the editing software that we know will work with the free LUT. So I hope that helps answer your question. The fourth question. I want to know if I can use the LUTs with the manual settings you tested for nighttime shooting. So this question relates to the video that we created and shared the best settings for low light and nighttime shooting. And in, at the end of that video, we concluded that the best settings for low light is ISO 800 and a shutter speed of 25. So that's a clip that I'm going to use to demonstrate how to apply color grading LUT to this particular footage. So I'm simply going to drag it to this new bin item. That creates a brand new sequence. I'm just simply gonna rename it test. Now the next thing you wanna do, as you know, search for Lumetri color. Once you find it, simply drag it over to the footage. And then in the creative panel, simply click that drop down. In the look is where we apply the light. So click that. And then we're going to browse for, in this case, we wanna go with the Everest LUTs. So I'm gonna choose sun kissed i could have chosen any one of these 20 beautiful luts from everest pack click open and there the color lut has been applied now you could do several things such as adjust the intensity um let's say you want to go to 85 percent or if you want to do additional changes maybe you want to come into the color grading panel which gives you a little bit more visibility a little bit more control as you can see, we've already reduced the intensity to 85. We can also increase the exposure just ever so slightly. Maybe increase the contrast a little bit there. Um, try and see if we can retrieve any details in the in the shadows. Bearing in mind this is nighttime shooting, so you you don't want to the noise to be that visible. Maybe with the blacks again, you know these controls are really very sensitive so very little movement they give you quite a lot so i'm happy with that and um let's have a look at the before so this is what it was before this is when we apply the lat and then made some basic corrections so let's see that in full screen looks beautiful so this answers your question absolutely without a doubt you can apply color grading LUTs to any low light or nighttime footage that you've shot. As long as you've shot it in D-Log format, it's nothing to stop you. And you've got so many LUTs to choose from, from any one of the Everest or even the Savannah packs. And then in addition to that, you've got a lot more control to really get the look and feel that you're after. The next question is, why rule out 1080p before even trying it out? This question is from Christian. Yeah, really good question, Christian. Uh, it's a fair question. Um, so if you recall, again, it's in the same video, the best settings for low light and nighttime shooting. I went as far as knocking out the 1080p without even showing any footage. And I think in hindsight, I probably should have, but I'll explain to you my reasoning for knocking it out as early as I did. So first of all, when you're shooting in 1080p with the DJI Osmo, the additional advantage you have is you obviously can shoot at a much higher frame rate. So you can shoot at a frame rate of 60 frames per second. And what this means is you, you can create really nice slow motion video at 1080p. However, that happens at the cost of resolution. So for me, I was looking at this footage mostly from a resolution point of view. So really the, the reason why 1080p was knocked out is purely for appearance from a resolution point of view. I wanna show you these two clips which I created around about the same time. One was shot in 1080p, the other one shot is 4K. And you can see what I mean by, you know, the, the difference is just, you know, remarkable for me between these two. So the first one I wanna look at is 1080p, even, if it, even in this freeze frame, Already I can see, you know, you've lost, you're losing detail within this tree here, that tree as well. If I play that back. So this is 1080p. Now in comparison, and in comparison, 
even in the freeze frame, this is 4K. So this is exactly what I meant by if we look at that versus that. Once again, 1080p versus 4K. I mean, the, the from a resolution point of view, this is the reason why I knocked out 1080p. But I do understand your your question in the sense that, you know, if you want slow motion, you can only achieve a higher frame rate using 1080p. So it is a valid question, but, you know, I've explained my reasoning for knocking it out first, first round, first second kind of. It was purely based on uh, the resolution of the image. There's just a lot more detail um, in this in this image here compared to to this. The next question is, in the shutter speed theory section, what's causing the pulsing in the video where the cars are driving past? This great question is from Ian. Now this one was really, really interesting question because I wasn't even aware this was happening in the footage until uh, Ian pointed it out to me. So thanks, thanks Ian for that. If, you, if you're not sure what, what we're referring to by this pulsing is, if you go to this video, the, again is the low light and nighttime shooting video, come to around about the eight minute 33 mark. And then if you start playing from there, I want you to keep watching what happens to this, to this tree here. And make sure you're watching this in uh, HD. So if I play this now, I've got the volume turned down so that you can hear what I'm saying. If you keep your eye on this, you will see, did you see that? It almost goes a little bit blurred for the split second, you know, the image appears just slightly blurred. And that's what we're referring to as a pulsing. So for me, it was a very interesting phenomenon because I'd never really observed it in the footage. I wasn't that critical in looking at this footage, but it is something that is happening. And so what I did is I went back to the original footage, which I shot, and actually you can follow along the, the best, probably the best way to see what happened in, in this particular situation is just start following the to and fro that we had with Ian here. Um, so what I did, uh, as I was explaining, I went back to the original footage. I checked for any pulsing. There was none of this pulsing in the original footage. Then in, obviously in the editing software as well, when I played it back, the program monitor, it looked fine, no visible pulsing. But when we rendered the file, that's when I started noticing the the pulsing. So originally I thought it was probably down down to the bit rate. Um, I exported at 10 um, megabits per second just to try and reduce the file size to about 1.5 gigabytes. I mean, this was a really long video. Um, so that was my guess at that time that it's probably down to the low bit rate, but I didn't do more tests. But Ian then went ahead and, you know, what he came up with is something that's quite interesting and something that I want to test out in full as well. Basically, I'll just go straight to this conclusion. So he did a couple of tests, which you can find using his link here. Um, if you click on that link, you'll be able to see the footage that he shot. And, and the conclusion that he reached is this pulsing only appears in NTSC. And this is what I was shooting in. I was shooting in NTSC. PAL doesn't appear to have the same pulsing artifacts that we've just seen um, in the footage there. And then he goes on to say that at 4096, which is the full 4K, the image in PAL appeared a little bit soft. And I think if you go to his footage here, you can, you can see that. So this is possibly, you know, the reason why we're seeing that pulsing is because I shot this in NTSC. And, um, but like I said, I hadn't actually noticed this before, but very interesting. And I'm definitely going to keep an eye out for that. So I hope that um, answers this particular question. The next question is, could you share with us the best batteries for the DJI Osmo? I'm trying to get extra batteries. This question's from Mohammed. So the best batteries, I don't know about the best part, but the batteries that we use is the original DJI Osmo batteries. And, you know, we have three. So at any one time, we've got one in the Osmo itself and two that are fully charged. And normally that gives us, you know, just under three hours of shooting and, you know, anything over and above that, you probably have to go come back home to charge it. So, yeah, that's what we use. We have had a look at other batteries that are available on... So, as you can see, there's several other brands here. Smart Tree, $49.99, but that's probably for two batteries, including the charger. Um, there's this other brand here, New More. Um, yeah, so, you know we haven't really found the the big advantage of of 
trying these other new batteries. We want to stick with something that we we know is is a DJI product that they probably tested it with the with the unit but that's not to say there's anything wrong with these other alternatives we just haven't tested them so i hope that answers your question and um and the final question where did you get the articulating arm that question was from jeff yeah so what jeff is referring to is one of these articulating arms that you've probably seen us use in quite a few of the videos that we shoot we think this is one of the massive accessories for any osmo out there we normally use this articulating arm when we want to mount the DJI Osmo in a vertical orientation because as you know, it doesn't have a thread mount at the bottom. So what we then have to do is you basically just screw that in on any one of the rosette mounts, just like that. When it's still loose like this, you basically want to try and align it as much as you can and then you start tightening this. But what's important is some of the add-ons that it comes with so the first one which i'll show you is basically like a spacer so this is basically got quarter inch thread on either end so on this end and on that end and all you do is you screw that on there and then you get a quarter inch thread on this side that you can then mount on a monopod on a tripod whichever uh, one you prefer and by the way we purchased this articulating arm from amazon and this is where we normally check for small little things like this and you know but i'm sure you can find them in other places like ebay and so on um, the thing is when you get these they normally come with these sort of attachments so this is the first one we looked at another one that you probably find useful actually i'm going to leave this one on so another really useful accessory to have is this little quarter inch thread adapter of sorts but what it has it's got two quarter inch tripod mounts on either end and what this allows you to do is because all the rosette mounts have got a female thread there if you want to mount something that's got a thread like this one then all you have to do is just screw that on there and that converts this rosette mount into into this setup and now you can attach several things on this end which obviously have the female quarter inch thread on this end so that again is something that's really really handy to have so this can also go to the bottom like that so it just increases your mounting possibilities and you you can buy a pack of these maybe five of this because they do tend to to have legs on them i always buy a bunch at a time but hardly find where where to find them they always disappear so i'll say maybe buy five or so uh, shouldn't be too expensive but they're really really handy the last one i'll show you is this one very similar concept the only difference is it's got a 3 8 inch female thread on one end and a quarter inch um, tripod mount on the other end and what this is useful for is when you want to mount the dji osmo like in in some crazy situation that you've seen us do using this kind of really really long this was our very first video that we shot you know the world's longest selfie stick you can then use this 3 8 inch adapter here to screw on to this end giving you now the ability to for example you can then mount your osmo like this always test you see there that almost fell always test all these knobs to make sure there's no movement at all before you decide to take this sky high because you've got a pretty expensive camera at the end of it and you don't want it to come crashing down but yeah it all depends on the shot that you're going for if you want to get three meter reach which is what this setup can give you then you know this is how we tend to use the articulating arm again you know use it sparingly you wouldn't want all your shots to be shot this way when you really really need that high above the ground shot then these little adapters would definitely come in handy and thank you to all those people who got featured in our first q a so we hope you found the answer to these questions useful and remember if you have a burning question on the osmo feel free to use the comment section below on our channel or head over to our website and use the contact form at www.osmotips.com forward slash ask once we receive your question we'll do everything we can to get an answer asap 
And don't forget to download your free colour grading LUT on our website. It's really simple. Just fill in your details and boom! The LUT is delivered to your PC or laptop. That's it. And that's all, folks. And don't forget to take your DJI Osmo wherever you go and shoot some epic content. Sai chin.